Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. And a warm welcome to this uh, webinar about finding work in Sweden as an international graduate. Uh, my name is Maria Johansson, and I work as an alumni relations manager here at Lund University. And by my side, I have my colleague, Karen. Hello, everyone. And Karen's going to be uh, managing the Q&A session of this um, webinar. And first, I think we will do a quick run through of some practical details. Um, so Karen, if you would like to share mm -hmm. our, a few slides with us. Um, as I mentioned, me and Karen, we work for the Alumni Relations Office at Lund University, and we are working with something called the Alumni Network, which is a network for everyone who studied uh, or conducted research or worked um, at the university. So if you are graduating soon, or already graduated or about to leave Lund University, uh, you're very welcome jo to join the network um, and you find the links on this page. And I can just mention that you don't have to take uh, notes. We will send these slides to you afterwards as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, you don't have to have graduated from Lund University to join the network. Uh, core students, exchange students and graduate students are equally welcome to join as long as you spent a semester here in Lund at the university. Um, also, if you need some inspiration and want to learn about other alumni or alumni who has been uh, working for a while, you are welcome to go into our blog, the Alumni Network blog, and read our portraits and other stories from, from the university. Uh, follow, us, follow us on social media, um, on our Facebook page, Instagram, and LinkedIn group. And if you have any questions, always welcome to contact us, even as students, of course. And uh, we also have some career resources that we can share. Um, the job and event portal when it comes to careers is found at uh, Lund University Career Hub. Uh, you create your account with your student credentials and there you find the useful guides and ads for jobs and internships and such. Uh, if you're interested in, in a startup so you do, or you have a great idea that you would like to create a company around, uh, you can visit Venture Lab. Uh, incubator con connected to the university. I'm sure we're going to mention LinkedIn during the session. And if you want to get more familiar with it and do a fantastic LinkedIn profile, uh, check out their students page. And the Swedish Institute has created um, a collection of articles about how to apply for a job in Sweden that you might may also find interesting and check it out. But you will receive this, uh, these links in an email from us afterwards, if you, tomorrow or on Thursday. Um, some host housekeeping details uh, or rules when it comes to this session. If you have any questions, post them in the Q&A. Um, the first 40 minutes, we will have a discussion, a panel discussion, and then we will move on to the Q&A session. However, if you have questions, you're very welcome to, to start posting the questions already now. Uh, that will make it easier for Karen as well to to gather questions and start off firing away questions to our panelists right away. Um, we will post this webinar on YouTube so you can check it out uh, many times afterwards as well. And the link will be included in an email from us that you receive after the event. We kick back into view. Um, yes, and now we're moving on to actual content of our webinar. Um, finding work in Sweden, uh, a question or a challenge that is of course um, a major thing for all students, no matter where you come from. But moving from a new country, moving to a new country, uh, of course, will also uh, give you some other challenges when it comes to language and culture differences. Um, and we are going to meet our panelists um, that are who are welcome to turn on, on their cameras, um, who actually went on this adventure and successfully secured a job in, in Sweden. So we welcome Renee, uh, Alexandra, Sean and Sami. Uh, and I'm going to let you introduce yourselves. First of all, thank you so much for joining us. You all are, are belong to our alumni ambassador program. So. Thank you so much for, for uh, joining. Um, and yes, I think we will kick off by just asking you to share a bit about yourself and a little bit about what you do now and 
your career story. So let's start with you, Sami. Hello, hello. Uh, so yes, I graduated back in 2021 and uh, I started master's in management in Lusum. Uh, and then since then I have been in Stockholm. I just moved to Stockholm soon after graduation and then I have started working as a consultant. I have an engineering background and I have a management master's. So currently my role is also kind of technical project management. Thank you, welcome. Uh, Alexandra, do you wanna share a bit about yourself? Uh, sure, and thanks for having me as well today. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Alexandra and I uh, graduated with a master in service management back in 2020. Um, I studied in Helsingborg and then I moved to Kalmstad and I work in Gothenburg. Uh, so commuting is a big part of my uh, Swedish work life, I could say so. Um, I currently work as an application consultant in Gothenburg for an uh, IT company that works with um, business document and electronic business transactions. And um, that's about it. Great, thank you and a warm welcome. Uh, Renee? Yes, hello, uh, I'm Renee. I studied, uh, or I did my master's in applied cultural analysis from 2015 to 2017. Uh, and after that, I started working in the startup uh, scene here in Malmö, where I currently live. Um, and I transitioned a few years ago into the design and kind of creative innovation space um, as a UX researcher, primarily, and occasionally a UX writer uh, when needed. Um, and for the last, I think, four or five months, I've been working in-house at Capgemini as a UX researcher or a senior UX researcher, continuing down the design path. Great, thank you. Uh, Sean? Yes, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sean. I graduated from the master's degree program in strategic communication uh, last year, actually, in 2022 um, in the Helsingborg campus uh, under the Faculty of Social Sciences. And today um, I live and work in Malmo um, in a software company in the IT industry uh, within the sales department uh, doing business development, which is uh, co-calling and co-emailing um, people uh, for my work uh, for the European uh, team. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, we're very welcome. Um, we're going to jump into your career journeys. Where you, um, when you graduated, what happened? What what made you take the leap and decide to work in Sweden? Um, also, I would like to ask you, what did what did you want to become when you were a kid? What was like the, what is, what is the dream path you were moving on to? Um, but let's start with what happened, uh, graduating from Lund University, how did you take about your career journey to find your job in Sweden? Um, I think we're gonna ask uh, Alexandra, if you would like to start, just quickly comment about that. Um, yeah, sure. Um, my career journey, well, I don't know, I don't know if I'm the best person to start with because I always think that I was really lucky when I got my, my current job because it was almost right after graduation. So I graduated in 2020 and then I studied Swedish for a year, which of course helped me a lot in uh, finding and uh, getting this job. And um, I think I, I got my contract signed about a month after it. So I really think I was just very lucky. It was just very good good timing. And so yeah, that's, uh, I think that can summarize it very, very short about uh, how, how quick uh, my journey was in a way mm -hmm. um, but there is still of course a, a backside to the story because I did apply to multiple multiple positions during my studies as well and during the time I was studying Swedish and I think that also helped me in a way training to to get the perfect interview I would say so uh, yeah that that's it mm -hmm. and, Sh and Sean how did you uh did you jump directly into your current position after graduation? Um, actually, similar to Alexandra, I would say that I got quite lucky as well. Um, started pretty much a few weeks after graduation uh, in July last year. At least that was with my first company. Um, now I'm with my second company. So slightly different situation, but equally lucky on that as well. And um, 
yeah, wanted to to live and uh, work in in Sweden after graduation. Um, so that was my plan from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Rene, did you plan to stay in uh, Sweden all along? No. No. <laughs> Uh, I had no plans to stay after I graduated. I was applying for PhD programs and just wanted to kind of wait it out in Sweden while I was doing my applications. Um, I played water polo for the water polo team in Lund and one of my friends on the team wanted to leave her current job. Uh, and so I just ended up taking over her job kind of as like an interim solution. And that kind of snowballed into uh, a career and a life in Sweden eight years later. Mm -hmm. and, and Sami, did you plan to end up in a, in a snowy Stockholm in November? Or what was your plan after graduation? No, I didn't have any fixed plans after graduation. The plan was just to study. And then afterwards, I thought, okay, let's try. I had uh, uh, some friends in Stockholm. So I thought, okay, why not? Let's let's. Uh, it's a big city. I, I like Stockholm. I came here in 2019 as a tourist back then. So uh, it gave a nice vibe. So I thought, let's try and apply. So I've been lucky, like Alexandra and Sean, <laughs> <laughs> that way. Yeah. Well, that's great. It's lovely to hear. It, but luck, luck is a is a big 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 thing when it comes to finding finding your dream position. Um, when it comes to practical, like what preparations did you make during your studies uh, for for kicking off your career? Um, Sean, do you have any good examples? Um, I mean, for me, I studied communication as an academic uh, career path, academic path, but uh, before coming to Sweden, my most recent job was uh, in, already in sales, in business, business development. So then thinking of my career prospects upon graduation, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm just going to try to do again my sales stuff. Um, and also the fact that I'm not a native Swedish speaker. Uh, so a lot of the jobs in communication industry kind of requires a bit of Swedish as well, which I'm not confident to do that. Um, so going to sales became like the, the path of least resistance, I would say um and um it became yeah my thing now for about a year yeah and did you apply for where did you find different positions to apply for uh 99 on linkedin <laughs> yeah <laughs> um that's fair i spend my time on yeah yeah is that the same for for the rest of you is linkedin the the place where you started to look for for jobs it is a very good uh, good point to start i would say so as well mm-hmm yeah, same for me as well. I uh, LinkedIn is a powerful tool, so I used a lot of filters to choose what I need and all that experience. Yeah, same. I think it's a good tool if you're unfamiliar with uh, companies in Sweden, um, especially if you're interested in a particular industry. Um, but I, when I transitioned from working with startups to working uh, within design the creative agency that I was at previously I just sent them a spontaneous application so um, it was maybe using LinkedIn to figure out okay what are the creative agencies within the place that I want to live which is in Malmö or like in the surrounding area um, and then it was a bit of like digging through their website and doing some cold applications so LinkedIn's definitely a good place to start but you might have to dig a little further yeah and what what would you um, advise someone who wants to make like cold application what what should be in that application letter do you think what did you put it uh, yeah I can I can tell you the way I got my foot in the door is essentially you have to find like what makes you very unique and um, a good bargain I mean it's it's a, maybe a pessimistic way of looking at it but like you want to make yourself seem like you are or you want to make yourself as sellable as possible and so my foot in the door was uh in academia, I had done quite a lot of writing. Um, and because I'm a native English speaker, like I could do copy work, um, but I was more interested in the more like research and design side of user experience. But it, so my selling was you get a researcher and a writer for the price of one. So two for the price of one. And that was what caught their interest. And they actually hired me as a UX writer and very quickly changed their mind. So um, 
that's how I've always posited my way to like get a foot in the door. Yeah. Well, that's a good advice. Have you have any uh, other of you tried you know, sent um, sent cold applications or like more informal applications or informal interviews when looking for jobs? Or have you gone the traditional way of finding a job ad and then moving on? Or do you have an example of when you, yeah, approach the company or employer some other way? I, I could probably add the... Um small thing here I, I i went the usual path and i found a job ad and i applied for that specific position but what i think really helped me into lending it after all was actually researching the company so it was not just like oh it sounds cool I'll just send something and we'll see how it goes i actually read about the company before i read uh, i found out that there was i know some other students that did master physics is based on the company and i mentioned it in my interview so i think like all these small details make sure that the employee sees you as somebody that actually was interested in it and looked it up and didn't just send an ad uh, applied just for applying in a way. Yeah. So mm. it, 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 you really, really put yourself up to the list. I think when you showed it that you looked it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sami or Sean, do you have any, any additional comments to the, the, the actual application process? I mean, I agree with what Lesendra says with regards to being prepared for the interview and actually researching the company, um, the people in the company and showing some interest in them. Um, because most times the person that interviews you is probably going to be your manager as well. So, um, yeah, if you can do some, uh, yeah, think a bit more creative way of finding out what they do, why are they hiring someone for the position, um, that could st help you stand up a lot in the interview process. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I can add on similar note that uh, at least what I used to do when I used to apply with these cover letters. Uh, sometimes, if you have an experience or if you have a project experience, then try to just include things that are only relevant because we, what we are doing might be a lot and then or might be less. So I used to just cherry pick the things that are related to the job description and that just give them that concise letter rather than writing. A big letter and including everything that I did. Most of the times it helped. Yeah, that's that's great advice. Um, <clears throat> except for what to write in the in the application process, I know that many of our, our students are um, have questions about language. I mean, this multi-million huge language of Swedish. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, I know that Renee, you told you you can have a good conversation with your mother-in-law and Sean, you're practicing a lot too, and probably uh, Alexandra and Sami as well. Um, let's talk about language. How? What was your language of, or level of Swedish language skills when you when you started applying for jobs at the end of your graduate or end of your studies? Uh, the 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 word is free. Let's let. Anyone who feels uh, you want to share <laughs> the, I the language put a sentence together. <laughs> yeah, I like I couldn't put a sentence together, and the mother-in-law thing is I that was the motivation for learning Swedish. Eventually, was to commun communicate with my mother-in-law. Um, but mm -hmm. it it has actually uh, it's been eight years, so so maybe that helps mm -hmm. the just like the duration of time. Um, but I did in between jobs actually decide to focus time um, when I transitioned from uh, working with, like in the startup scene to to design I had like a period of unemployment and I decided to focus that time on intensive Swedish and I like that's probably one of the best decisions I've ever made just in terms of like it's improved my personal quality of life but I uh, I don't use Swedish as my professional language but uh, when we're doing user interviews uh, in user research, sometimes people aren't comfortable doing um, interviews in English. And so being able to facilitate like finding words for them because I can like do from Swedish to English or participate as like a note taker uh, if they want to do them fully in Swedish, like that is super valuable. Even if it's not like my working professional language though, I would highly advocate putting in time and resources to that if possible. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you, Alexandra, you you did you took a year after your graduation as well and studied Swedish. Is that something you recommend as well? Exactly. Uh, I would recommend, but I know it's very competitive. So I would say if you if you don't get in the first time, just apply next year because you might you still have a chance. But it is quite a competitive program that Lung has. Um, yes, I did study, and I think uh, I had the time because, of course, it was the Corona years and. Uh, there was not, there was not many, not so many opportunities. I could say so, um, and I took the chance and I applied and I, I got in, and I studied for a year. And for my interview, I, I was able to fully, uh, uh, to go fully in Swedish for that interview. So I think it was also very appreciated, uh, at least for my position. Um, I do use uh, some Swedish in my daily work life, so. Uh, um, I think here uh, maybe a useful note would be to add that it really depends on the industry that you apply, how much of the Swedish level you need and how much English can you use in your daily work. Uh, but I could definitely say that there are benefits to it. Mm, you can just talk to your coworkers on the floor. You can have your one-to-one -one meeting with the manager since it's going to probably be Swedish. So you can have it in, in Swedish. And um, I can assure you that it will be appreciated that you can speak Swedish and if you're going to keep improving and improving it will only bring you benefits in the long run mm -hmm. um, yeah when I finished my master's program last year I was more or less finished with the SFI course D um, as well so that was my benchmark uh, but thankfully with my jobs I did not require uh, to use Swedish it's just English um, only uh, Swedish will be a bonus, of course, uh, and will be appreciated, as Alexandra said. Um, and until today, I would be, say, around B1 level in, in Swedish. Um, so at least in terms of reading and, and uh, listening, um, yeah, the passive ones. Um, and it's always good to practice learning Swedish uh, whenever possible, uh, of course. Um, and yeah, just do your best with it. Yeah. And I can, I can definitely second what Alexandra said as well about the industry. I think from my experience, it is very industry dependent. For example, when I when I apply to the technical roles, I didn't have this challenge at all. There was no barrier at all. And I had a lot of interviews in uh, completely English, but they didn't even ask that if I can speak Swedish or if I'm willing to. But if you go a little bit towards management side, then you feel that the need of Swedish language becomes more and more important. So as it, it does add a competitive advantage, definitely, if you are other than if you're going to apply for roles that are not very technical, maybe sales management. But uh, yeah, so, uh, in technical roles, it doesn't matter much. So it's more when it's the interpersonal uh, roles that will be helpful yeah. to have some some level of Swedish, if I uh... exactly. Yeah. Are there any other skills um, that you uh, you planned for when when preparing to start to search for a job? Any other uh, specific skills? Not that, that that you feel that you maybe didn't wasn't included in your program, but more something that you you needed in order to be um, uh, fit for the roles that you were applying for. Hmm. This is super industry specific, but if anyone is interested in any type of user research or quali qualitative research and working even remotely next to a design or a designers, highly recommend you take time to learn Figma. That is the like only program that designers are using nowadays. And I spend all, like all day, every day in Figma. And I wish I had had that in my master's program. <laughs> So. Figma, if yes, yeah, F I G M A. Oh, okay. So it's a it's a prototyping and a wireframing platform. But if you are going to work remotely close to design, you need to know Figma, even if you're a researcher or a copywriter. So yeah, it's very industry specific. No, but I think it's good. It's good advice. Yeah. Anything else that you, uh, uh, Alexandra, Sami? John, um... Um, similar to Renee, I think the my industry is the software industry, the IT industry, and it's really specific as well in the sense that uh, in the sales uh, positions that we have, my colleagues come from different backgrounds as well. 
because there's not really a master's degree for sales. It's just, you know, you use different soft skills together to uh, do your job. Um, so I've got, um, yeah, colleagues from the management program, from my self-communication program, another one from entrepreneurship program. Um, so it's just using what you have learned in order to help to add some value to the company in the position that you're applying to. Um, and that's where it comes into knowing the company, knowing the product, um, and being familiar with how um, the software as a service industry operates uh, in general. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I'm also thinking about the transferable skills that probably you, you lack a lot of technical skills. Like I did when I started my position, I, I, I really sometimes look back at it and uh, I think they really saw something in me or I don't know why, but I lacked a lot of technical skills in a way. But what I did emphasize during my interview was my transferable skills that I learned during my studies, for example, critical thinking or the ability to learn something really fast. And I think that that can really bring you advantage as well. If you think that you lack something in an application when reading, don't hesitate and apply again, because it might be not a priority for them. Um, a lot of times I hear that they mention personal suitability. So if you find something in common during the person that interviews it would also help you a lot so i think this transferable and soft social skills can also bring a lot to the table yeah That's yeah good. i can uh, yeah sorry um, no? thinking about the technical side if you already have good technical skills then i would say it focus a lot on soft skills like communication skills as well for example if you are being interviewed it matters that you have to show that you are eager to learn and you're open because uh, the interview, during the interview, the person is also kind of judging you that how hard you will be to work with or how easy going you are. So as a personality, it, it's important that you show that you are open, you're self-aware, you have good communication skills, you can talk to colleagues, you can handle uh, different, you can handle multitasking and stuff. So I think it's very important that you show that you are eager to learn. Yeah. yeah, that's also a very good advice because I know that during a, like the interview, they are looking for, like, will this person actually, will this person actually match our company and be comfortable in our company? And uh, so that's really good advice too. I think we're going to talk a little bit more about <clears throat> professional networking. You, you mentioned that you, you, you were lucky. Um, I think it's a combination of luck and good, hard work. I, I I would like to say for all of you, but but um, would, how would you describe your um, professional network here in Sweden? How did you go about building at one, and how what, when in time did you do that? Um, creating connections when it comes to to finding specific jobs and and so on. Do you have any? Anyone who would like to start with uh, like sharing how you got about, um, if you feel you have it, maybe that's, it, maybe that's not a necessary thing. I don't, I don't know, uh, but uh, professional networks, anyone would like to comment on that and your experiences for, of creating one? Well, I did hear that the majority of jobs are not really posted publicly in Sweden, that the, but they are available in a network, so to speak. It was not my experience, and I don't know if I'm lucky or not, but I'm such an introvert. So for me, it's really, really hard to grow my network in that way. I think it's very hard to reach out to people. And I and I think that a lot of people will understand how I feel. Um, um, but miracles do happen. So maybe you will be able to apply to a job and get it in the, the usual way. But it might be easier if you do have a network. I think it's it's a really good uh, site to look into. Um, what I do, I usually, when I applied, I, I tried to connect to the recruiters on LinkedIn and keep in touch after because maybe you were not really a fit for the role at the time, but maybe it's something in the future will open and they will have you over in a database or in the LinkedIn and it will be easier next time. So I think that could be something that I could share from my experience. Keep in touch with the people you interviewed, uh, follow the companies still, and maybe in the future it will um, bring you benefits. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah sorry, go on, Sean. <laughs> uh, I totally agree with what Alessandra said. 
And also for those who are interested in the software service industry, uh, whether it's in communication, um, sales, customer, uh, customer service, marketing jobs, um, one place I would go to is Mink, uh, M-I-N-C in Malmo, um, because that's where the Malmo tech scene kind of like comes together. The community is there and you can always go up to the, the building, to the office and network with some people over there because um, they are, those of them, the companies are small and they are startup people and they're always looking for new talent to hire for their companies. Um, so that's one place I would recommend. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, just going to say that I think professional network is very important because even when we are working, I get to hear a lot that if we know someone, then we should refer that person to us to a specific opening. Before they advertise it, they just internally circulate an email saying that if you know someone, please uh, forward this role to them. So I think one of the things that I used to do when I was a student, uh, I used to go to different career fairs and then just look at different companies or different places where you're interested in, go to that uh, person and talk to them and ask relevant and short questions. And once you have some certain conversation with them, just go home and send a very short professional LinkedIn message and add them that, hey, I saw you there and uh, it was really nice talking to you. So I think even if you do it for like 10 to 12 person and that one of them can actually vouch for you when you apply to a certain company in that company that, yeah, I spoke with that person in real life and uh, he looked interesting, then it can come to one way. Yeah, that's great. And and if you are if you are a super introvert, I know I don't know that many can feel a bit uh, worried about doing that personal interaction. For example, at career fairs, do you have any advice if you're an introvert um, job seeker, how to go about how to because uh, you still have to go go out there and interact with people, but how do you get uh, over that threshold, the first very scary threshold to to start interacting and start creating your professional network? Would you say? I think if you are I... at a career fair, um, yeah, I think one good way is to start uh, asking them about what they do in their jobs because I think for the people who are at career fairs as well, they, they are happy to talk about themselves and what they do. And that gives you an insight into what the company is about and also why are they there. And this, this person itself could be your future colleague as well. Um, so I think that's one way to start. And um, if you if you find yourself like you don't you don't know how to continue the, the conversation, um, you can always like pull out your LinkedIn and just you know take out the QR code and ask them to scan it or you scan yours something like that, um, and then you're connected with them from there. Um, so that's a very quick and easy way to do it as an introvert. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, I think if you're introverted as well, uh, maybe taking like a more digital route is uh, perhaps more beneficial like I seem very chatty and I guess I am but I actually don't really like talking to people like face to face because I don't have much of a filter so if I have to do something at work that is like maybe giving difficult feedback or you know if it's an intimidating situation I tend to write things down and so I could see that if I was having to make a cold call or introduce myself to someone and I was intimidated by that I would prefer to write it so then I could kind of uh, the English word is now escaping me. Um, like edit it before I send it out. Mm -hmm. So that might be another way to like, if you're, especially if you're utilizing LinkedIn, like I've had people message me before and I try to respond to those. Um, so that's another avenue. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, we're jumping into your, uh, into your workplaces and talk a bit about cultural challenges or differences or adventures that you have experienced if you would like if you have any experiences you would like to to share with us from from working in a Swedish um, workplace and what you find being um, different what to what you're used to I think the timing of things is something that takes a bit of adjustment um, both in terms of I answered this in the chat like um, 
going up towards the winter holidays and going up towards um, or leading up to midsummer, things really slow down. And so you might have slow response times and people really, do, people really shut down. Like if they're like, I'm on vacation for four weeks, you won't hear from them. Um, but on a more regular basis, when you're working with people who have kids, there's a lot of kind of protections around uh, parental leave. And, and so the work schedules, what, what I found for people who have kids is they're online or they're at work very early and then they leave around two or three to go do like pickup. Uh, and then they're back online once the kids go to sleep. And so um, you might have to learn how to, depending on how you work with that colleague, how to adjust to their schedule and then how to still kind of protect your own time. And it's just a, like something to be aware of. I don't think it's like a good or a bad thing. I mean, it's great that they like can have work-life balance, but you just ha might have to kind of adjust depending on who's on your team. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah I've heard that, th that, that parents have two nine to three sessions each 24 hour period, apparently, yeah. <laughs> So have you experienced any other like things you find interesting about working in the Swedish workplace that might differ from what you're used to? Yeah, I can go with the one thing that I noticed here is that it's uh, it's a bit different. It depends on culture to culture, how you give feedback or how you communicate with others. And in Sweden, it's I have noticed that it's not very direct, but in other cultures, it can be very direct. So it's important that here when you're giving someone a feedback, especially if you're, let's say, managing a team or you're leading a team. So you have to be as polite and as nice as possible to sugarcoat that, that even if that person is a hard person to work with or is affecting the team, you cannot be too direct. So you have to first be slowly, you have to weigh in, uh, transition into that phase and sugarcoat things. And uh, so I think how we give feedback here is, is a difference. And uh, yeah, I think that was the one of the changes that I noticed here. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I think, uh, Karen, how, how do we look at the number of, how many questions do we have? Or how, or is it yeah, we have quite a, a few rolling in. I know we've touched on some, because some people have like multiple questions in there. Uh, questions there um but if we want to take one more discussion then we can hop into questions yeah, let's, talk, or, yeah? let's do the last one like mm -hmm. your words of wisdom to to share with the with, with the crowd the students uh in a few words what would you say looking back what do you wish you would have known before the process of securing a job and what what is your advice to um someone starting their career in Sweden and being maybe graduating this this uh, spring uh, when would they start applying for jobs or should they already be looking um, if it, each and every one of you would like to to just share a bit of word of wisdom to to the students listening I can probably uh, say a few words quick. Uh, I did like that you mentioned before that there is luck, but there's also hard work behind it. And I couldn't agree more. I do I do tend to be self-criticizing and minimizing my own little win-wins. But beside the good luck, you did put a lot of work in your application. So keep that in mind when you apply that it is gonna it is gonna be a journey and it, it's it's not gonna be easy. I can I can tell you that. Um but uh, after hard work, uh, if that's what you want and you want to find a work uh, place in Sweden, just keep applying um, and follow all the tips that you hopefully heard some good ones today and uh, you'll probably succeed. Thank you, Alexander. Um, yeah, I think if you're planning to go into the technology scene, the IT scene uh, in Sweden, um, learn how to optimize your LinkedIn profile as best as possible because the technology people tend to have LinkedIn as the biggest or one of the biggest social media platforms uh, that we use. So your future colleague is probably active there and that's where you can start connecting with them, asking them about their work, how, they, how they're doing things. And, and then when they you know, do have an opening in the future, you can just say, hey, you know, uh, we spoke before. Uh, I see an opening now. Uh, 
a, a, a position that's available and I've just applied for it. So uh, any you know tips you can give me for the interview, blah, blah, blah. Um, so things like that will really help. And also, yeah, as Alexandra said, to be uh, very hardworking in applying uh, for jobs because uh, job seeking is also like a full-time job in a sense. So keep doing yeah, five to 10, 15 applications, uh, quality applications every week. And uh, eventually you will start uh, landing interviews and move on from there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, I definitely agree with what Sean and Alexandra mentioned about uh, the applications. So I have the same uh, advice that be consistent and apply consistently. It's very important that you don't give up and you, you have to be consistent in your number of applications. And like Sean said, quality applications. Uh, I would also say that to use one CV for all jobs, have different CVs for different types of roles, customize or tweak them a bit for different roles based on the job description. That's what I used to do, and uh, you will see the difference in that. And another thing to take uh, to take into consideration is that in Sweden, the recruitment process can be long. It can also be two to three months easily. So you have to consider that because in some countries, it's very quick and should maybe in two weeks. But in my experience, uh, when I was applying and the jobs that I got offered, they, they on average, they took two and a half months, two to two and a half months, completing the whole recruitment process if you include all the tests and all the interviews. So make sure that before you graduate, at least three months before, uh, before graduation, you start applying and give yourself ample amount of time. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think you can go about it two different ways you can either like be very confident in your capabilities and try to convince employers um, that way which I think is what I took um, the route I took earlier on but I guess also if you're interested in a specific industry or in a specific company stock their socials like I know um, in the industry that I'm working in generative AI is a big topic and so if you can demonstrate that you have some kind of knowledge in that and it's always going to be a hot topic a few years ago with sustainability. Now it's all about chat GPT and generative AI. And so figure out what they're posting about to see if you can kind of spin that and how you are um, valuable in that regard, because that's especially at the forefront of people's minds. So you can uh, find ways to make things work for yourself. Great, thank you so much for that advice. Um, and with that, I think I leave uh, the word to you, Karen, see if we have a number yeah. of questions. I know we were touching a little bit on it just now, but um, there have been a few people asking about, you know, how early should you start the job hunt? Um, was it, you know, already at the beginning of your studies, you're already thinking, oh, where do I want to go? Or did you wait till you were kind of wrapping up and writing your thesis or after your graduation? Um, what would be your kind of best advice as to how early to start doing the job hunt? Um, I know Renee mentioned also a little bit about maybe avoid the summer months. I would second that because that's hard to get feedback. So maybe not wait until just after graduation because people are starting to kind of wind down. But how early... Did some of you guys start? Um, Alexander, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Um, from my experience, I would say as early you want or as early you can or as early you feel comfortable with that because honestly, sometimes I still apply to jobs just so I can go through interviews or like meet some new people just to get this experience and not forget how it feels. And especially as an introvert, you do want to get a bit of experience going through these discussions, understanding how, what kind of questions you maybe will get and just being comfortable in such situations. Um, even if it's not going to be the first, um, like the first interview will not get you the first job, but it will definitely put you on the right path, get you comfortable to interviews, get comfortable to writing applications, understand what they're looking for and, and so on. So for me, it was, uh, I would say as soon as, as soon as you feel like you're ready to to do it. Um, for myself, yeah. Uh, last year when I was doing my thesis semester, uh, that was kind of also when I started to think about the what would happen to me after graduation. And that was when I started to research and apply for jobs. So for me, it was around 
March, April uh, already um, when I began. Uh, and part of that was because I wanted to get some interviewing experience as well um, to be familiar with how the interview process works in Sweden. Um, and yeah, at some point that led to my first offer. So I think that helped a lot as well. Yeah. Anyone else want to add to their experience? I didn't yeah. start until, uh, well, like I said, I was applying for PhDs, but I didn't really like consider any jobs until, um, I guess, like September, October. Um, and this was relevant in 2017. So this is not advice, but there used to at least be a um, visa that you could apply for that was a six month extension on your residence permit. Um, to see, like, to seek job after graduation. I think that's what it was called. Again, this was quite a few years ago, um, but those are, that's something I guess that you can look into to get some extension to look for a job. There is still such a visa. Yeah, I'm not sure if there is. There might still be, but again, yeah, that could be. This is not advice. Yeah. That's Always best to go directly to the migration board. 2017 was a long visa time ago. Questions, yes. <laughs> But if that, yeah, I know that has existed at some point. So if it is available, that's definitely a good thing to look at. Um, uh, and I know um, a few others were also curious if any of you during your studies, if you did internships simultaneously or to kind of get your foot in the door, or was it really like focus on percent studies and then go into the job market? Um, I had to do a work placement as part of, maybe you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, so for Maka, you have to do a work placement uh, as part of your studies, and it's essentially to create, like collect the data that's going to be in your master's thesis. I wrote my thesis about beer, so I worked with two breweries, one in the U.S., uh, which was quite easy to get a foot in the door because the owner was an alumni of uh, where I did my bachelor's. And then I just kind of cold emailed a bunch of breweries um, in the area and ended up working with a Danish brewery. Uh, so that was a bit of luck. Um, and I didn't directly translate into any kind of work opportunities, but then I somehow became known amongst my friends and the, like I said, I played water polo, the water polo players as the beer girl. And I ended up doing a few beer tastings as like a side hustle for a few of the startups that were at the ground, um, which is a startup hub that I worked at uh, right when I graduated. So it was kind of an informal introduction uh, into the space that I ended up. Yeah, I see there was actually a question that came in about you, exactly the MACA internship. If you started that before the actual semester, internship semester, or started it when the... The course I did too, too, which was ambitious. So I actually started, I think, like a year in advance. Um, okay. Because I couldn't do them simultaneously. One was in the U.S., so I went home for a few months and then uh, immediately came back. And I think I was doing the second work placement while I was actually studying. So like you do, you do have to balance, but that's yeah. just part of life, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, I can mention I also studied the Mac Applied Cultural Analysis, and I did my internship during the summer between the first and second year and then into the fall semester to kind of wrap up the project I was working on. So I think it's kind of flexible, at least in that program. So if you have an internship built into your program, definitely take advantage of that as a way to network and kind of test out companies. Um, anybody else want to share an experience of a part-time job or internship during their studies that kind of opened the door to something or contacts? Um, the internship course was an optional course in my program, uh, so I, but I did not take it in the end. So it was uh, for me, it was 100% study and then 100% uh, work. <laughs> <I'm No>. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Then we also had some questions about, um, I, know a little, I know we did go into about language uh, already, but just as a and a question that we didn't touch on was um, when you did your applications, did most of you apply in English or did any of you attempt doing your applications in Swedish? Um, I would mm -hmm. suggest applying in the language that the ad is on. If the language of the ad is in English, apply in English. Um, quite sometimes you would see comments or notes in the ad saying that we only accept applications in English. And, or in Swedish, 
and I would just suggest to read to read the uh, ad very carefully and just follow the instructions because I believe they they do notice a lot of time that they they say something in the ad and then they don't see it in the application. So I would just follow what it says in the job ad. Uh, but for me, I always apply in the language of the ad. If it's in Swedish, then you should be ready to be able to speak Swedish in the interview as well. And of course, apply in, in Swedish as well. Um, see here, then we also had a question about, um, uh, where did that go now? My list keeps jumping around here. <laughs> um, um, about if anybody, I mean, I think all of you were already in Sweden when applying for your job, or were any of you outside of Sweden while applying and uh, found your job that way? Everybody was in Sweden. Yeah, okay. Um, and we maybe won't have too much to add in on that question. Um, um, also, we had maybe a quick question. I know of uh, some are curious about uh, if we can share the emails of you guys on the panel. Um, I don't know if all of you want to share emails or not, but we can perhaps those of you who are willing to, we can inform you guys afterwards. Otherwise, perhaps we can recommend they reach out to you on LinkedIn. I'm assuming you guys are all there. That's also a great way to practice your LinkedIn skills. <laughs> Um, um, and then we also had a question about, um, uh, where did that go? Um, oh yeah, about, um, from your experience, maybe how formal versus informal would you say, um, the job market is in Sweden, um, especially maybe if comparing to, if you have knowledge about maybe other European countries, um, but would you say it's more informal or formal? Who'd like to start us off with that one? Uh, Sean, it looks I like think you're it's... thinking about a lot. Or maybe Renee, if you want to start, go. I think it's very dependent on the industry that you work. Uh, mm -hmm. To like not to be hyperbolic, but I work in design, and I had a colleague who genuinely just wore a bra and a jacket to work every day. <laughs> um, and so, and that like for formality kind of extended across everywhere. It was very informal. It was a smaller agency as well. Um, so I think if you're in a small industry, then you that's like a bit of a shock. Um, or so like a small agency or a small company, it might feel a lot more, a lot less formal, a lot more familial. And I actually struggled a bit to kind of find the distinction of professionalism, especially coming from the US. Um, so that's definitely something to be aware of. And I guess ultimately do what you're most comfortable with, um, but always err on the side of caution. Now I work for a much larger company and I don't think I would show up to work wearing, I don't, wouldn't go to my other, my previous employer dressed kind of scantily, but I think in smaller offices, maybe it's a little less formal. So uh, when if you go for an interview, kind of observe that and then you can, Kind of adjust but always err on the side of caution when you're starting out that's how i would approach it mm -hmm. i can also add that it even depends on the department in the company i can say that a department that probably people that work in it can wear t-shirt to work while the salespeople will have the suit on <laughs> so it can be yeah, informal and formal at the same time mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Um, we also had a question about, um, aside from, yeah, we were in uh, a lot of you were using LinkedIn as a good site to kind of search for job opportunities. Are there any other resources or websites you would recommend for looking for various job ads that you found to be quite helpful, or maybe even those that weren't as helpful as you had hoped? Maybe it can be some good words to the wise. Um, I don't know if, uh, Sammy, if you had something to share. Hmm? I used to use Learning University's job portal as well. Uh, I found a lot of good roles there as well. And then if you are interested in specific company or an industry, for example, if you are in uh, interested in automotive industry, then you go into the Volvo. Just go into that company's web page and go into their career section. So this is something that you can do as well. Mm -hmm. 
good advice. Yes, the Career Hub uh, job portal here, you know, the university is great for looking, especially for internships or starting uh, positions. So, yeah, don't forget that resource you have where there's jobs posted there specifically for new university students and graduates. Uh -huh. uh, anybody else have some good uh, advice on that topic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of wrap up with one of those questions too about where else to look aside from LinkedIn or about how common um, paid internships are. I don't think paid internships are so common. Um, I don't know if any of you guys experience that or more of uh, unpaid internships, but sometimes you might find part-time student work. Um, for example, in the university, we sometimes have student workers on an hourly basis. So it can sometimes keep an eye out for those kinds of things for while you're a student looking for that. Um, I would say probably most internships are unpaid. Um, and it looks like our panel's nodding, so their experience would be similar to that. Um, um, let's see here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, did any of you actually, did any of you do the SFI uh, language courses? Or... Yeah, me. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. Did you would you say that that gave you a good kind of base level of things to kind of get the ball rolling? I know Alexander, you also did the courses through Lund University, but I would wonder if uh, if that kind of gave you enough to kind of get your foot in the door, feel like you were somewhat confident with language. I would be confident to like buy a coffee in the espresso house, for, mm -hmm. for example, but not confident to do an interview in Swedish. Mm -hmm. um, at least as if I sent you course D, which is about um, a strong A2 or a low B1 level and that's really yeah barely conversational-ish I would say mm -hmm. so it did not really help me with the interview process. I actually had some uh, I took a few months of SFI as well before I uh, decided to go on uh, for the official course um, but to, if to compare I would say SF, SFI would be very slow so if if you're looking for a very up to speed and quick way to get a hold of the language, I don't think SFE is the best option unless you have a lot of time and you're ready to to commit like a day or two per week. Mm -hmm. They probably have some more intensive course, but um, from my experience, I don't think that as strong said would really help you in the professional life. Mm -hmm. I did a uh, folk university set that, so I paid. Um, and I did four months of intensive, so it was three hours a day, five days a week. Um, and then I'm lucky enough that my partner also speaks Swedish, although he's not the best teacher. Sometimes you have your friends, but they're not necessarily the best practicing partners. Um, but I've continued. So the four months of intensive were very grammar focused, and I think that they were really worth the money and the time in terms of laying down a foundation. And what I've done is kind of a maintenance requirement. Uh, if you do get a job, um, look to see if one of the benefits is language. Uh, at my last place that was, we had a like essentially private tutoring because no one called into the intermediate class um, twice a week for an hour. And that was really great. Um, and then I am now taking a one, once a week, uh, one and a half hour conversational course, again, through Folk University Tessa, just to kind of maintain it. Because again, your friends or your partners might not be the best, the best people to like maintain the language. So find what works for you. But I think that like just the quality of life both in a work perspective and also a personal perspective, like it's a worthwhile investment. Um, let's see here on another topic um was curious uh, here of if any of you have experience um uh, regarding working with maybe recruiting agencies have any of you gone via academic work for example or did you find it was worth the uh, worth a shot to look through using a recruiting agency or the old-fashioned way of just applying to jobs yourself anyone have experience with that I did do some research on recruiting agencies uh, in Sweden. Um, in the end, I did not get a job from them, but I do see that they have some uh, yeah, jobs available that were 
suitable or relevant for me as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a possibility. Um, and when I spoke to one of the founders of these uh, agencies, they said that they are there to help the, the companies look for talent and not to help the talent look for a job. So that was the issue that I had. Um, I was like standby for like forever. So um, they do exist, but I wouldn't count on them uh, entirely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anyone else? Sammy? Yeah, I haven't been employed directly through them, but I have been in contact with a few of them and a lot of them have approached me through LinkedIn as well. Uh, but uh, I know people, I know friends who have had this uh, luck with them. So I would say it's it's something that you should definitely consider and uh, there's nothing wrong with going that way. Mm -hmm. I can probably add that there's also a difference between in being employed by the recruiting agency and also the consultant and also directly by the company. And I also had some classmates that did succeed and I got a job for it. Um, and I can say that maybe the salary expectations are not really going to match what you think, but I think it's still a very good start because you will gain some experience and it can help you find the next perfect job for you. So it can, it can be a good thing, I think, looking into uh, the recruiting agencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I see we also are getting quite a bit of upvotes here about the uh, viewers are curious also about, is there a service here at Lund University where someone can help uh, with writing their CV and cover letters? Um, we did. I did share, answer in one of the questions uh, a link to the um, an earlier webinar with CV and cover letter tips. Um, but we can probably also include that in our follow up email for all of you who are attending, so you can watch that as well. Um, and our colleague who works with career services um, on occasion does also try and help uh, students a bit with looking over their CVs. And depending on what faculty you're at or what program you're studying. Um, there may also be a resource uh, more locally there for you that um, that can help you with reviewing your CV and give you some um, insider tips. So um, there is some availability out there. So um, also feel free to email us if you have questions that help us. We can help you navigate that as well. Um, um, and then also I know, uh, which is something I might also try and share in the chat here, because I know there's also a question of, uh, some of you are curious about those who've maybe gone over to Copenhagen to work. We also did a similar webinar like this with a panel of alumni based in Copenhagen. So we can also try and share the link to that webinar if you're curious about working in Copenhagen. I don't know if have any of you on this uh, panel worked in Copenhagen or no? Okay, no. Um, just in case a previous job took you over there. Um, and then um, another question was me that was kind of interesting would be if any of you kind of what was the um like you you mentioned you know about yeah maybe getting lucky with meeting the right person or the right contact but is there any of you that have maybe some really a good concrete tip of how to kind of get that first job so you don't go this long duration after graduation unemployed like how did what was it that really for you gave you that um job right after you graduated um is there anybody that has a good tip with that Sean yeah um I think being visible and being active on LinkedIn are two different things um having a LinkedIn profile is one thing but if no one knows who you are it kind of defeats the purpose of that so to be active on LinkedIn and to be visible you want to keep posting uh about it uh, with the open to work banner um you can post like hey I'm looking for a job um, and you can specify the positions that you want to work in so that when recruiters are looking on LinkedIn for a possible candidate to interview, um, they can type in that position and your profile might show up because you posted about it in the past. So mm -hmm. I think that is very important. Uh, and that is what helped me the most as well. Yeah. Yeah, networking seems to be the big key there, whether it's yeah, the digital version behind the the screen there on LinkedIn or going to events. There was also, I think, somebody that had asked about if any of you actually went to a visited a company office just to meet people there and kind of get a foot in the door was that maybe also another critical way of way you know? i would actually advise against that um simply from a security point of view um mm -hmm. i know that uh, there's been some security concerns in sweden um 
and I know that uh, several companies have uh, like sent out to their employees, like you need to be vigilant about visitors. Um, so if you are interested in kind of getting a foot in the door, I think reaching out on LinkedIn and seeing if someone can take a coffee, even if it's off, uh, not off campus, if it's like out of the office, like at a coffee shop nearby, um, I think that is a, uh, just simply because there are some security concerns. Well, that's a good thing to remember too, yeah. <laughs> they have good intentions, but sometimes maybe they are misconstrued by somebody else, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Alexander, did you want to add to that? Mm. Well, I was thinking to an about earlier question. <laughs> the previous, exactly. Yeah. I was thinking mm -hmm. about the previous question because I feel like even when I was looking for a job and I was looking for tips, you always expect that one golden tip that is going to work for you or like work for a little bit. I don't think that's the case there. I don't think there is a one golden tip that will get you uh, the job and will save you the time for applying and will, like speed up that process. I think that's not the, the, just to be honest and still optimist here, this is not really the right look at it. It's, well, it's good to hear tips and hear the stories of how people like got jobs. Um, I think you need to keep in mind that your story is separate and unique in a way. And while it's good to try out everything that other people do, your success story might be completely different. Um, so I, I think that that's just something to keep in mind that, well, it's good to follow tips. Um, I don't think there is any super tip that will spare you the time in that way. So what I can say is just read that very carefully. That's a very golden tip. Make sure you know what you're applying for and you know the company. Well you, get, well, you get the question of why you apply to this company and this position, you know what to say, and just be honest in your interviews. And I think that that will, that will put you on the right path. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing to remind us of. Everybody has their own unique experience, a different success story. So uh, thank you for that. Anybody else want to chime in before we move on to the next question? I agree that there is no silver bullet. Um, ultimately, I think you just have to be confident. I think when I graduated, especially from the perspective of like, um, I, I'm not Swedish, I don't speak the language, I, I don't necessarily feel like I belong here. Um, I think earlier in my career, it was very much like, oh, I'm so like ingratiated to you for giving me this opportunity. But the fact of the matter is like, I'm awesome and I've made this path for myself. So. I think the confidence actually gets you quite far. Not arrogance, but like, no, I'm totally capable of doing this and that's why you should hire me. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and then we also had a question here that I think was more uh, for Sammy, um, but about uh, those with an engineering background. Um, what are maybe some of the best ways to get a job for an engineer in Sweden? Um, you know, a lot of companies have graduate programs. Is it good for people to uh a good thing for people that just finished their studies or um to do those kind of graduate programs yeah definitely mm -hmm. programs uh if you are targeting a specific industry then uh, again go go to their web page search different companies that are in working in the, that industry i know that one of the famous uh graduate programs is of uh, volvo arla has a good graduate program so I definitely recommend these types of graduate programs and uh, because uh, you have an opportunity of trying different fields, even if you're an engineer or if you are from a management background or sales, if you are in a graduate program, normally they have a rotation program where they rotate you in different uh, business units. So you kind of get a taste of all the aspects of organization and then you can choose which one is best for you or where you want to work. So graduate program is definitely something for people who do not have this before or who want to get a taste of different fields before choosing what they want to work with. Mm -hmm. well, one question came up again. What was the name of the graduate program you just mentioned? Is it the Arla or Volvo? It's or... A, Volvo has, uh, has one. Then Arla has a very good one. I think it's called F15 or F, well, F something. F something. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Google Volvo Arla F something. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm not entirely. So I worked as a consultant at Volvo. Uh, my last job for nearly two years. I'm not entirely sure. It's like the new graduates or something. I'm not sure the name, but I can kind of give a overview of it, which is they have them do different rotations. I think they're like in six month slots. So we yes. would get new graduates come into our cluster and at least like our cluster took it seriously. And so we really tried to just like, here's an assignment and you need to drive it. And then we're going to like raise you up and, and definitely give you a ton of responsibility. So it's like a crash course. I couldn't recommend it more like in terms of you get these rotations, but at least like our cluster tried to use it as like a springboard for people. And I know that they ended up hiring quite a lot of the graduates. Well, that's good. Yeah, I see somebody wrote here too. So F15 applications. Um, yes, I'll also throw in that Capgemini. January. Yeah, January to the yeah. September. So uh, keep your eye out for that, I guess. Yeah. yeah okay. Capgemini and, uh, also has a similar program. If anyone wants to write that down, I can figure out what the <laughs> name is momentarily. Yeah. Uh, Another thing to keep in mind is the deadlines for the graduate programs are usually in around December, January. So if you're going to graduate, let's say in May or June, they start way, way, way early because it's a long process of uh, recruit uh, tests and then a lot of interviews and then assessment center. So you need to keep your uh, keep an eye on the deadlines. Definitely, it's easy to miss them. Yeah. Well, start start early. That's a good tip then. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, let's see here. Um, we also had another question here that popped up about if anyone's worked within the public sector within Swedish government or uh, institutions. Um, is there anything specific about the application product to the or process to those um types of organizations? Have any of you been within kind of the public governmental sector? Or have all been within the private sector? I, I don't oh, have sorry. any experience personal, but I think I've uh, I heard something uh, about even citizenship requirements. So it really depends on the type of uh, governmental institution, mm. which also could be something to keep in mind that you might need Swedish citizenship for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah. If it's maybe certain types of governmental in, uh, institutions can can it can be like that. But if you're applying, for example, at a university or, um, like Lunds Commune or tour, tourist office and things like that. Um, there I don't think there's uh, any kind of, um, citizenship requirements. But um, I don't know that their application process is so much different. Um, but maybe more so. Um depending on the type of work you're interested in, things like that. But again, um, good to maybe also network on LinkedIn and can maybe reach out to fellow alumni of, out there that are maybe working at some kind of institution you're interested in and ask them as well about what that process looks like. I'm sure more than uh, our four alumni, or yeah, four alumni here tonight are happy to help and give some words of advice. Um, I know we're running out of time now, so looking at the clock, um, but I thought maybe a fun question to kind of wrap up with um, that maybe can turn uh, what is a big threshold to get past, but maybe give it a positive twist of what was the biggest challenge and how did you overcome it um, in your job search and uh, landing your job in Sweden? Um, I see you're not all thinking. Um, Alexander, would you want to get us started? We talked about it. I think it's the language. But again, the solution is just go for it and try and learn as much as you can. I, I think I, 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 I got this tip as a job seeker from, uh, I think during my alumni program, the student alumni, uh, that even if you're going to speak a bit of Swedish during the FICA, it might mm -hmm. get you the chance to just get the job because they will see that you're trying or you're, you're doing your best. And um even that can help you in a way. So even the minimum can really be helpful. And um, I had a, a second point that just slipped my mind. <laughs> I think nowadays also a big question is work from home versus working from the office, which uh, I think it's also a barrier nowadays. <laughs> um, be ready for a more hybrid model, but uh, remote is very, very rare, I can say. 
for me that's that's also I think because okay again I commute for me that's my pain I <laughs> have to commute a lot so working from home definitely brings advantages to to a job mm -hmm. thank you uh Sammy would you like to go next I'm sorry can you repeat the question please and um, uh, what was the, the the biggest challenge and uh, how you overcame it when uh, going through the job search uh, yes I think the biggest challenge is not getting a response uh, mm -hmm. if you're applying so I always say that be consistent be patient before you get your first response even especially for international graduates who do not speak Swedish and who, are, who don't have a lot of experience in their CV already so I would say it's a, it's a time taking process so be patient and be consistent and um, that was the biggest challenge that takes time. Yes. Sean? Um, yeah, I would say one challenge that uh, I've seen and I've also gone through is being very specific on the one industry and one department or position that you want to work in um, because that will affect your, let's say, interview experiences, uh, the people that you're talking to at these companies. Um, because I know that when you graduate, you feel like, you know, I want to do like 10 different things, anything I can do, uh, I just want to get a job. And that actually harms your job search process because being too generic uh, makes things, um, makes you feel like you're not focused on one thing. So try to eliminate your options or your choices to three or less than three, um, and then focus on there, and then you start to see results soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good advice. Uh, Renee? Yeah, I think the most difficult thing other than language is probably uh, just getting the foot in the door. And that just takes a lot of kind of patience, trial and error, and I guess persistence. Um, but I think maybe something hopefully to end on a positive note is what I have found since I've been here for a while and changed jobs a few times. Um, is that once you kind of get through that initial hurdle of getting your foot through the door, every subsequent job search has been so much like easier for me. Um, and so it's like the, the pain that you experience getting that first job really does kind of like open the floodgates for you in the future. So you might not be getting your dream job right off the bat, but it will definitely like pave the way down the line. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Uh inspirational uh, a little pump up there at the end so even if it seems yeah. difficult at the start um there are people who have gone through yeah lots of endless applications it may seem like and then get a job others may just be lucky and the first cold call they make ends up to a, a great job so like alexandra told us everybody has their own unique journey so um we wish you all luck in your job hunt and hope that you guys got a lot of great uh insider uh, tips and uh, first-hand experiences to kind of give you some some things to think about as you are, you know, now maybe starting to think about whether you want to stay in Sweden and work here, uh, what things you need to start doing now, what you are going to mark on your calendar to do next month or sometime in the spring, um, and then keep an eye out for our other webinars that will be that will probably be available for students regarding CVs and cover letters and interview tips and things like that. So um, we hope you guys all had a good evening. And yes, we didn't get to get to all of your questions. I'm sorry we ran out of time. But um, again, feel free to reach out to us if you uh, would like to discuss things more. And we're, we'll try to help you out as best we can. Yeah. I don't know if Maria, think, you have any other last minute uh, things to uh, add. No, just a big thank you to our panel. Um, and and uh, wish you the best of luck. We'll keep in touch as well. And uh, yeah, have a have a lovely evening, everyone. Uh, we will end the session. That will kind of end, close down the window for everyone. So that might be good for you to know. So thank you so much, and hope to see you either in a IRL event in the future or mm -hmm. in our next webinar. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks, thank everybody. You, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.